As you may have heard, NBC Today host Megyn Kelly's show was canceled this past week following her on-air remarks expressing acceptance of blackface. It's a racist show business practice most of us thought was long gone. But as Maurice Dubois is about to tell us, blackface has a long history in our country. And we caution you, his report unavoidably includes many offensive and disturbing images. It happens all too frequently, often at Halloween, but not exclusively. They thought it was a joke, but it really just was not funny at all. For example, two years ago in Maplewood, New Jersey. Her daughter posted this photo of herself and a friend in blackface. The two girls had no idea what blackface was or the history of it. The history of blackface is long and complex and deeply ingrained in our culture. Who was that lady I saw you with this afternoon? <laughs> uh, that was no lady. Uh, that was my wife. <laughs> Even Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd blacked up. Fantastic, isn't it? Wine run all night. For more than a hundred years, white and then black performers wore dark makeup and created not only a popular theatrical form, but stereotypes that are still with us today. This makes you uncomfortable, doesn't it? Absolutely. It does make me feel uncomfortable to talk about these things because they are incredibly disturbing and revolting. Eric Lott, a professor at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, says blackface represents a strange mix of envy, fascination, desire, and fear. Explain the fear part to me. What, what are these white performers, what are these white people afraid of? They're afraid of black groups, mobs, rising up and taking the power. Minstrel shows began in the 1830s, and white performers used burnt cork or later black grease paint. Minstrelsy eventually became the most popular form of entertainment in the country. Ah, yes. I asked Margot Jefferson, the Pulitzer Prize winning critic, to look at some images from the New York Public Library. The shininess of the black against the big white clown's mouth, the hat, the overlong tailcoat, mocking. It always gives me the jolt that racist history does. Blackface is so tied to comedy, to people enjoying themselves, to people having fun, that that rattles you still more. Well, Mr. Tambo, you seem to be enjoying yourself this evening. Enjoying myself? I sure is. <laughs> White minstrel performers claim that what they did on stage was based on their perceptions of how black people lived. Some of this came out of a genuine fascination with the music, the songs, the dances, the performance um, styles of black people. But it's also where Jump Jim Crow was born along with other characters depicted as lazy, lying, or buffoonish. Remember, this was all happening before the Civil War. Slavery was all about creating um, visions, types, stereotypes of an entire race of people as subhuman in every way. By the 1860s, African Americans began using blackface on stage. Why on earth would a black performer put on blackface and demean him or herself. They were, th look, this is the 19th century. They had limited options. They were expected to. Why? Um, because it made the audiences comfortable. You can be fascinated, you can be excited, but you can always feel superior. In effect, the black makeup on a black performer became a theatrical mask with many layers of meaning. Of Professor Eric Lott. The mask, I think, says to white audiences, you have nothing to fear. Go ahead, enjoy yourself. To black audiences, I think any number of things uh, might have been communicated, like, can you believe that these people are making me put on this mask so they will be entertained? You know, in other words, it was a kind of winking to the black audience. But it gave black performers access to the stage. 
One of the biggest black stars to come out of the minstrel tradition was Burt Williams, who wore blackface from vaudeville to Broadway. It's clear that he was a genius of a performer. But how did he reconcile performing in this demeaning art form? He was very melancholy about it. He knew it was necessary for his career, as all other black performers knew it. Minstrelsy on stage basically died out in the 1920s, but blackface lived on in the movies. I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles. In 1927, Al Jolson starred in the pioneering talking picture, The Jazz Singer, playing a young man who prefers singing popular music rather than his family's traditional Hebrew prayers. But I know where the sunshine sets. I don't want to look at it. What, what reaction do you get? I totally understand. Wait a minute. I don't like the way he said that. In the R Gang comedies of the 1930s, Spanky appeared in blackface. Buckley, did you say Spanky was in a lot of trouble? Yes, sir. He's the gag here is that the gang doesn't realize that that's Spanky in blackface until they actually see Buckley. So the gist of it is that you put blackface makeup on anyone and they become black. And that's supposed to be hilarious. And it's supposed to be really funny. When he grows up and it goes on. During the golden age of the Hollywood musical, Judy Garland. When he walks down the street, folks will say, please to meet Mr. Franklin D. Roosevelt Jones. Bing Crosby. That's why we celebrate this blessed February day. Abraham. Fred Astaire and many others, all blacked up. It's still in the culture. It is too easy, I think, simply to dismiss the history of blackface as that racist stuff. And we're, you know, most of us are better than that. I don't think most of us are better than that. We are that. That's what we are. You know, some people say in order to move forward, we need to put this stuff behind us, as painful, as just upsetting that it may be. Well, you know, any form of history that gets suppressed or repressed or you know, erased out, it comes back to haunt. What has to happen now is a discussion, an acknowledgement of this charged, complicated, painful history.